Hello. Well, today I'm here to talk about the second film in the original Star Wars trilogy, and the fifth chronologically in the Star Wars saga. And that, of course, is Empire Strikes Back. Now, <clears throat> many people say this is the best, uh, one of the best sequels in the entire, just in film history, just in general. Many say this is the best Star Wars film ever. I disagree with that. As many of you know at this point, I've talked about A New Hope quite a bit. To me, Episode Four is the best in the entire series, saga, whatever you want to call it, Star Wars, the Star Wars franchise. But I do enjoy this film quite a bit. Um, to me, I tie this film in second place with Return of the Jedi, which I will get to later today. But I, um, but yes, uh. Empire Strikes Back really has a lot to do with uh, the characters and how they interact. Like how how does Luke become a trained to be a Jedi? We saw some basic um, he get basic information about the Force, and some stuff about like the history of the Jedi a little bit briefly from Obi Wan, but not much training. The only extent of training was him deflecting the blaster bolts from that remote that was going around and at random shooting at him, in which he would have to use the lightsaber to make it so it won't hit him. Uh, he was having a bit of a hard time with that, as we saw in the film, uh, but once he let go and just trust his feelings and had a blaster shield on, you know, he he was good and he could almost see it. Well, here in this film, he learns more about the Force, more about just some training, though not so much with lightsaber training, but um, this film takes place between th uh, three years between A New Hope. You know, three years after A New Hope is when Empire Strikes Back is coming along. You know, so I think there there's been quite a bit of time, and I'm sure you know with Luke with the rebels and everything, um, and most likely since the destruction of the Death Star, they've probably gotten a lot of support since uh, rebellion has grown quite a bit, um, which we'll even see more of to an extent with um, even the uh, Return of the Jedi. But, you know, in Empire Strikes Back, the, there's a rebel base, a secret base on Hoth, Snow Planet, and from being found out, and then there's a big epic battle that happens in the very beginning of the... Oh, sorry about that. Um, I mean, as opposed to the end, uh, the big beginning is... Or the big battle is at the beginning. Um, because it's like, you know, in a way, like the director, Irving Kirshner, said, you know, in a way, you couldn't really top the Battle of the Death Star at the end of the original film. So what could you do? Well, you could, um, you know, have a big battle at the very beginning, really get a lot of people excited and even more so engaged. Like, uh, so, uh, and it's very effective. Darth Vader is pursuing Luke. He knows who Luke is since the end of the uh, previous film. And now he wants Luke. He's interested in Luke. And then we see later on with the first appearance of the Emperor that, uh, to bring him so that he could like, be turned to the dark side. And if he can be turned, he would be a great asset to them. And it's like, he will join us or die, is what Vader says. Uh, 
we see this we see who you know this emperor who was just mentioned briefly in a new hope um, uh, who they had a discussion and just very briefly there was you know uh, the emperor got mentioned and that was the end of that here we actually get to see him though it's for you know it, it's a Though it is more of a, uh, a hologram, it's a hologram, not so much a full-blown in the flesh emperor. But it's pretty cool to see the emperor in this. Um, regardless of which version you watch, the unaltered version, which is a combination of a woman with chimp eyes and an ominous voice for the emperor. Or the special edition, which now has um, uh, Ian McKellen, Ian McDermott, McKellen, and, and Ian McDermott as Palpatine, reprising his role from *Return of the Jedi* in the prequels, um, to help with the continuity of the, the when watching the saga from beginning to end. Um, you know. The, Many new characters, there are some new characters introduced, like, I don't know if men, but, you know, there's essential characters like the Emperor. There's obviously Yoda, um, who is in substitution for um, Obi-Wan, because originally, you know, Alec Guinness wasn't supposed to get killed off in A New Hope, but because of the, well, Lucas had in the script of him just standing there, uh, not doing anything in the last part of the film, decided to kill him off, much to Alec Guinness's chagrin. And um, because of that, they have to, he, uh, Lucas wrote this Yoda character. Um, and, and it's really. Uh, and Yoda is an incredible character. Uh, people love Yoda. He's one of the most beloved characters of the, in the franchise, obviously. Um, the way he talks, the way he looks, he's just, just an incredible character. Very unique. Um, and Frank Oz, doing the puppeteering, does an incredible work here. As he's done on, like, the Muppets and, uh, I believe he worked on Sesame Street. He's just, he's just great. Originally, um, Oh, the guy who created the Muppets. Oh, that'll come to me later. Not even gonna worry about it. But he was supposed to be, or not supposed to be, but he was who George Lucas wanted to be. Uh, Yoda, to puppet Yoda into voice pup uh, Yoda. He was the voice of Kermit, and he thought. He'd be good to do, uh, you know, uh, uh, Yoda. I'm gonna look this up real quick. Jim Henson. Okay, yeah, Jim Henson. He was who Lucas wanted to be Yoda. Apologize for that. That was just too dumb of me not to know. I know the Muppets and I, all that. I knew the connection with Star Wars because Frank Oz was with the Muppets and then he was Yoda. And Jim Henson was asked to be, you know, Yoda. Said couldn't do it, and, could, and then had Frank Oz con consider Frank Oz. It's what happened. And he did a great job. He's incredible. He's fantastic at puppeting Yoda, obviously, and voicing him. It's just. Such a unique character. You can't see who else could be Yoda. And especially now since you know, Jim Henson has unfortunately passed away back in the 90s. They'd have to replace him for the prequels. Uh, but fortunately, Frank Oz is still with us. He's able to voice Yoda uh, in all the movies 
needed. And, you know, you know, Yoda is such an, I don't know, just how he treats everything that goes on with Luke and how he first, he doesn't identify himself as Yoda, just sort of plays dumb and oh, he's kind of annoying to Luke, which is really funny. And then it's really clever when you find out he's he's in this, he's the smartest and like the best Jedi ever, essentially. And then we hear Alec Guinness is only there for like a day or two, a couple days. That his voice comes in to help do what he could to persuade uh, Yoda to help finish Luke's training because they need Luke. Um, so. He trains, and um, that's what he does once off off. He goes to Dagobah and uh, Swamp Planet. Very, you know, just really an interesting planet, unique planet, and it's a uh, world not. That I don't know if it, I don't think anybody would really want to go to, but you know, because of the events after of of uh, Revenge of the Sith, I think you know. Who's going to look for a Jedi there? I seriously doubt anyone. But it's really cool how just unique these worlds are. And just how different they are. Snow Planet for Hoth and then uh, Dagobah, you know, Swamp Planet. And then with after that, uh, Yoda, or Han, Leia, 3PO, and Chewbacca all go and are escaping the Empire. They're being pursued after leaving Hoth. Um, uh, Luke took R2 and his X-Wing. So, you know, that, that's where R2 is. Um, but, you know, 3PO, you know, ship gets damaged. And then it's, it's like, oh, we're going to have to fix the ship. Or no, the hi hyperdrive. Yeah, the hyperdrive. They've been fixing it before. I don't know. Yeah. It's broken. They keep getting shot at and everything. and Just so much goes on with, in the pursuit uh, the Empire gives to um, uh, the Falcon. And the, the, uh, the, the journey that goes forth um, just to get out of there and then Fixing the hyperdrive and then um, hiding from the Empire and just uh, being able to uh, essentially outsmart them, which is what I think. Um, uh, they, uh, there, there's, there's a romantic element that comes in with Han and Leia. And you could say that it was there in episode 4 because of you know, the dynamic of the, the scoundrel and then the princess, sort of the bad boy, and then she, she falls with him. Um, though yeah, Leia tries to, he essentially just like makes Han jealous by kissing Luke after Luke you know, gets attacked by the Wampa at the very beginning. Is recovering, uh, so you know that element is brought more to the forefront. Um, time or two, here comes three PO, and he kind of ruins the moment, uh, and as. As they're all off to the Bespin to see Elena Calrissian, who's a character I'll get into in a bit. Um, they're pursued by Boba Fett, who is the bounty hunter that is so popular, despite him uh, having few lines to say, and isn't in the film much. Nor is he in the in Return of the Jedi much. 
you know, there's a lot of bounty hunters there. The Empire has got to help track down uh, uh, the Falcon and Solo because, you know, they know, they, they know well, either they know where Luke is or we'll find a way to get him to us so Luke and Vader can meet face to face, essentially. Um, and Boba Fett is the one sees this when they release trash out in the into space and the Falcon goes off with the trash. Uh, uh, Boba Fett's there and then follows them. Once they get to uh, Bespin, uh, Cloud City, um, they, they meet Lando, who's an old friend of Hans, and, um, you know, and, um, he takes a liking to, you know, Leia. Lando likes Leia. It's very beautiful, and, you know, Lando's quite charming, and then they're taken to a room, but then 3PO, you know, gets separated from them, and then gets destroyed. And then Chewbacca later finds 3PO and has to essentially put it back together. It's a, it's a lot of the, what happens is quite, you know, it, just explaining it, obviously, it's, you know, these movies, like, you know, in a way, words can't do them justice, but it's like, just some of these events, just recalling them, it's like, it's interesting what all goes on. Uh, because honestly, uh, the story is very isn't in the original trilogy. It's the weakest story it's of the entire trilogy. Episode four and Return of the Jedi, or No Hope and Return of the Jedi, both have stories that have a lot going on. And yet, it's very story driven. Where this film is mostly um, character driven. Things happen, yes, but when you compare it to the previous, the first film, uh, third film in this trilogy, it's lacking in terms of story. Uh, Han and Leia being chased by Darth Vader and the Empire. Luke is being trained by Yoda. Luke senses they're in trouble once they begin on a layer of double cross by Lando. Because uh, he had no choice. And then uh, Luke shows up. There's a fight. He goes to try and save his friends, but he's the one that needs saving in the end. And of course, there's that big reveal where, spoiler alert to anybody who has never seen this film, though I'm sure most people know this and have seen the movie, which is. Uh, Darth Vader reveals to Luke that he is his father. And as a kid, before the prequels were ever a thing and we're just watching them on VHS, I was surprised and stunned. I'm like, what? And then in Return of the Jedi, you find out more about, a bit more, and obviously the prequels, you find out how all that happened. It's very character, this film is very character driven. A lot of these big moments are why people say I, why this is the best in the Star Wars saga. Again, I don't agree, but I do love this film. It is an incredible film. It's a great sequel. Uh, Lee Brackett, I believe that's her name. Yes, she wrote the original, the first script based off of George Lucas's stories and his ideas that he pitched to her. He, George Lucas, unfortunately, was not pleased, and he sort of, like, asked her to um, rewrite it and talk to her about it. I mean, there were certain elements he did like, but he would incorporate a lot of these elements later, like like a, a lava planet and all that stuff would 
for instance, would be in Revenge of the Sith. But, you know, she had cancer and passed away before she ever had a chance to um, rewrite the film. So, unfortunately, uh, she, she doesn't she didn't get to rewrite the script. And it's interesting how she gets credit for screenplay when uh, most of the stuff that happened in her script. Again, there are some stuff that I'm sure many people already know, so I'm not going to delve into what got into the script, but there's very little bit. But it's interesting how she got a screenplay credit when George Lucas himself didn't give himself credit because... He rewrote this script, incorporated a few things he liked from Brackett's script, and then essentially uh, put all the other stuff, most of the stuff, to the side um, that could be used potentially for another time, another film maybe, if you wanted to do more after the trilogy. And then Lawrence Kasdan, who's the other uh, person credited for the screenplay, he came in and, according to Kazan, he rewrote Lucas's script uh, pretty much beat for beat, but just punched up the dialogue. Because, you know, George Lucas isn't the best at writing dialogue, but, you know, got it punched up, and uh, there you go. Um, yeah, this, this, this film is uh, it's really good. It's pretty cool. Um, um, that's really all I gotta say uh, again I love this film I don't say it's the greatest of the Osaka but that's just me what do you think? do you love this movie? do you dislike this movie? Um, there might be some who don't find it as enjoyable or beloved where do you stand? Um, you can comment below what you think. Um, and, uh, yeah, really. Uh, just have a good day. Have a good weekend. Have a good week. And uh, until next time, I'll see you all later.